Good morning. It is 7 a.m. and we are ready to begin our Radical with the Word series once more. I want to welcome those who are logging on at this time. We are happy that you have chosen uh, to start your morning with us, to start your week with us. I'm going to remind you of what our objective is. For many of us, uh, we are in the habit of reading a devotional book in the morning. Others might listen to a sermon or something of that nature. Other individuals may read the Sabbath school lesson. All of these are wonderful aids to Bible study, but they really should not substitute for Bible study. Our objective with this series is to get back to just simply reading the word. And we are using an acronym, SPACE, which stands for a sin to confess, a promise to claim, an attitude to change, a command to obey, or an example to follow. And while we are reading the scriptures, we will be asking God prayerfully to reveal to us, is there a sin here that you're challenging me to confess? Something you're convicting me to confess. Is there a promise in your word here for me to claim this morning? Is there an attitude of mine based upon what I'm reading and hearing and seeing? Is there an attitude that you want me to change? Or is there a command that you want me to follow? Excuse me, a command that you want me to obey or an example to follow? We may see all of these. We may just see one or two of these. But I'm encouraging you as you see them to go ahead and place them in the chat box so that we can interact with them, benefit from one another's perspective. But our main objective is to be simply reading God's word. We've been going through the book of John. This is actually the beginning of our uh, third week, I believe. And we are on John chapter 11. I'm going to be leading us in the New Living Translation that happens to be uh, my favorite version, and I'm inviting you to join along with me. Let's begin with prayer uh, as we start John chapter 11. Dear Heavenly Father, we are thanking you for this morning, for this day, for another opportunity to serve you. We are still inviting uh, your power and your presence relative to this COVID-19 virus that we are all uh, wrestling with. We are praying for those who have been impacted personally. And we're asking that during this unprecedented time while we are on lockdown, that we would use this time to lock down more thoroughly uh, by studying your word. Lord, we wanna emerge closer to you. So reveal yourself to us today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. John chapter 11, beginning with verse 1. The Bible says, a man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. This is the Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend, is very sick. That sounds like an example to follow. Whenever there's a challenge, whenever there is a concern, we can take that thing straight to Jesus. Verse four, but when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus's sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the son of God will receive glory from this. So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Finally, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. But his disciples objected. Rabbi, they said, only a few days ago, the people in Judea were trying to stone you. Are you going there again? Jesus replied, there are 12 hours of daylight every day. During the day, people can walk safely. They can see because they have the light of this world. But at night, there is danger of stumbling because they have no light. Then he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. The disciples said, Lord, if he is sleeping, he will get better. They thought Jesus meant Lazarus was simply sleeping, but Jesus meant Lazarus had died. 
So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there. For now you will really believe. Come, let's go see him. Thomas, nicknamed the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too and die with Jesus. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Wonder is saying Christ was not afraid of death. That's an example to follow. Interesting. Even the other disciples, Thomas said, okay, let's follow Jesus. Even if we follow him to our death, appreciate that. Look at verse 22. Martha said, but even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. She is looking at the fact that her brother has died when she heard Jesus said, this sickness say, this sickness is not unto death. So she doesn't really understand. But even in the face of disappointment, she still has the faith to believe that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. I think that's another example to follow, that in our prayers, when things are not going the way we think they should, when we don't understand, to, to, to still trust that Jesus will give and will get from God whatever is asked in Jesus' name. Verse 23, Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Sounds like a promise to claim in the resurrection. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? Je yes, Lord, she told him. I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. Then she returned to Mary. She called Mary aside from the mourners and told her, the teacher is here and he wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to him. Verse 30, Jesus had stayed outside the village at the place where Martha met him. When the people were at, who were at the house consoling Mary saw her leave so hastily, they assumed she was going to Lazarus's grave to weep. So they followed her there. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him, he asked. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. The people who were nearby, standing nearby, said, see how much he loved him. But some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across his entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he has been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. Many of the people who were with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw this happen, but some went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the leading priests and Pharisees called the high council together. 
what are we going to do? They asked each other. This man certainly performs many miraculous signs. If we allow him to go on like this, soon everyone will believe in him. Then the Roman army will come and destroy both our temple and our nation. Caiaphas, who was high priest at that time, said, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't realize that it's better for you that one should die for the people than for the whole nation to be destroyed. He did not say this on his own. As high priest at that time, he was led to prophesy that Jesus would die for the entire nation. And not only for that nation, but to bring together and unite all the children of God scattered around the world. So from that time on, the Jewish leaders began to plot Jesus' death. As a result, Jesus stopped his public ministry among the people and left Jerusalem. He went to a place near the wilderness to the village of Ephraim and stayed there with his disciples. Verse 55, it was now almost time for the Jewish Passover celebration. And many people from all over the country arrived in Jerusalem several days early so they could go through the purification ceremony before Passover began. They kept looking for Jesus, but as they stood around in the temple, they said to each other, what do you think? He won't come for Passover, will he? Meanwhile, the leading priests and Pharisees had publicly ordered that anyone seeing Jesus must report it immediately so that they could arrest him. We've read now the entire chapter, chapter 11 of John, and I want to encourage you as you listen to those words, as you read along yourself, did you note any sins to confess? Did you note any promises to claim? An attitude to change, maybe a command to obey or an example to follow. We have a couple who have responded in our chat. Barbara, good morning, Barbara. Barbara is noticing an example to follow in verse 41. Let's go back to verse 41. Verse 41 said, so they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. An example to follow, remember to acknowledge God for his miracles. Wonderful. We don't need to take credit uh, to ourselves as if it's because of some power that we have had or some power that we have. We need to give God credit for his miracles. Also, you can see in here, Barbara, when he says, roll away the stone, that is a command to obey. Frequently, there is something that Jesus will call us to do to pave the way for a miracle, to participate in his working of a miracle. Here we are told, they are told to roll away the stone. We need to obey whenever God asks us to do something to pave the way for a miracle. Maybe he's telling us, you know, change your diet to pave the way for me to heal you from diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. Gator, good to see you, my brother Earl. A promise to claim, verses 25 and 26. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life, amen. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Do you believe me, Martha? Amen. This gets to the root of Christianity. We just celebrated Resurrection Sunday on yesterday. The truth of Christianity is that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And anyone who believes in him will live even after dying. That is the ultimate promise to claim. Amen. Amen. Any other sins to confess, promises to claim, attitudes to change, command to obey, example to follow. I see an attitude to change in converse. Think about the fact, I'm looking at verse 45, it says many of the people who were with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw this happen, but some went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the leading priests and Pharisees called the high council together. What are we going to do? They asked each other. This man certainly performs many miraculous signs. If we allow him to go on like this, soon everyone will believe in him. 
then the Roman army will come and destroy both our temple and our nation. Here they are conceding, acknowledging that Jesus is performing many miraculous signs. They believe that it's happening, but they are more concerned about their temple, their nation. That would be they are more concerned about their church, about their religion, about their status quo. The attitude that needs to be changed is, look, I am going to trust in Jesus regardless of what changes as a result of it. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to put him and his uh, command, demand for fellowship and the reality that he's the Messiah. I'm going to put that above any other uh, things in my life that I have been doing, that I have been following, that I have been worshiping. I think that's an attitude to change and probably also an example to follow. As we read morning after morning, we are encouraging you to try to make application. And the SPACE acronym helps us to try to do so. I'm hearing another one. I'm seeing another one from Wonder. She says, a sin to confess helps us focus on minors instead of majors. I'm not sure I'm exactly understanding that. I feel like frequently we focus on minors instead of majors, and maybe the sin to confess is for us not to be focusing on the minors. Help me if I'm misunderstanding that one to give me a little more clarity. But I do think the big picture of this story, I mean, think about the fact that Lazarus is one of Jesus's friends. They expect him not to die. But the big picture of Christianity, there will be twists, there will be turns, but our faith needs to stay firmly lodged in Jesus's promise that he is the resurrection and the life, regardless of what comes our way. The worst thing that can happen, the worst bullet, the biggest bullet that the devil can shoot out of his gun is to kill this body, but he cannot destroy the soul. Wonder is saying we are interpreting it correctly. We do not need to be focused on minors. We need to confess that sin and we need to stay focused on the major. The big rock of Christianity is that Jesus has overcome death. That is great news. That, that is what gives me confidence to live my life, to share the good news of the gospel. There is nothing that anybody can do to me that can take away my eternal life that God has gifted to me. Amen. Earl is uh, celebrating that which you wonder. He's saying, yes, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I don't know if there are any other responses that we have. I do believe that this word is a wonderful word for this morning to remind us as we go throughout this day that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And that even though we die, we are dealing with this pandemic. Yes, it's scary. Yes, it's fearful. Of course, we would rather not uh, succumb to this illness, to have our friends and family succumb to this illness. But the promise is certain that even if we die, we have everlasting life. Pastor Ogis is saying verses 45 through 53 shows us how Satan and evil men will conspire together against us. That is true. Earl Gator is saying Satan's best shot has no ability to prosper. Amen. I believe those are promises to claim. Praise the Lord. We are about at the end of our time together. Uh, so I have time for one or two more. Pastor Ogis is uh, acknowledging that there is a spiritual warfare in progress. Spiritual warfare is in progress. Our attitude needs to change to understand that there is spiritual warfare in progress. I'm gonna use the last minute that we have to pray that God will apply uh, what we have read to our hearts today. And that as we go forward throughout this day, throughout this week, that we will continue with this word in our hearts. So let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the amazingly good news, the great news that you are the resurrection and the life. Even if we die, we will live again. Father, give us that certainty, that assurance, and the confidence that comes from it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll look forward to connecting back with you tomorrow morning. Everybody have a great day.